Hey, Typology Tribe, Ian Morgan Cron here. I'm in the Typology Studios with my dear friend, you know who I'm going to say, <laughs> Anthony Skinner. Ian Cron. Woo! How you doing, man? Well, I'm all the better for seeing you. Oh, same, same. So what have you been up to lately? Well, yeah. this and that. Yeah. You know, I've actually, for the last two weeks, I've been in kind of a lull. Have you? Yeah, because I was. We went to San Francisco, Annie and I, and we did an Enneagram conference there, which was fantastic. Got to see my daughter and my son-in-law, mm -hmm. Paul and Maddie. That was fantastic. But since then, I mean, for whatever reason, things have been kind of weirdly quiet. Well, I'm, I'm just been trying to avoid the coronavirus for the last <laughs> two weeks. That's my. That's been my whole agenda for two weeks. There's been a the, the 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 overcast in Nashville as well, which just kind of makes you sort of right. you know sleepy, stay inside. It's just like the funky kind of right. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, now and of course the working on the book. Yes, my new book, and right. you know the that that book is going to be hand delivered to the Harper One on April 30th, Woo. baby. So it is you know coming down it to the is wire. To the wire. Wow. Yep. Mm -hmm. So that's happening, uh, and. You know what I'm excited about, right? Yes, tell us. March 21st. Woo woo. San Diego. I'm dancing right now. Balboa Theater. Yes. We are doing the first ever Typology Podcast Live. Let's tell the people who some of our guests are going to be. Man, you know what? We should call this the Typology Podcast Review. <laughs> exactly. I mean, because yes. it's not just you and me, man. No. Right? No. So it's not just, okay, come and watch me do an interview with somebody. Because that actually sounds as exciting as I don't That like. doesn't really fit either one of us. No, no, no. So here's the big announcement. Yes. It's you. It's me. Special guest singer-songwriter Andy Gullihorn, woo -woo. who is amazing. He's unbelievable. Right. So smart, so gifted, so talented, and so freaking funny. So freaking funny. And yes. we'll be interviewing live on stage San Diego Tell us. resident <laughs> Bob Goff. Goff. Yes. Oh, my gosh. Bob, Bob Goff. Goff will in be with house. us March 21st yes. in San Diego at the Balboa Theater. Bob Goff. Andy Gullihorn, Ian Cron, Anthony Skinner. I yes. may even bring my dog, Percy. Now, we the thing is, I, I, I want to let people know, we've done something similar to this that we've that have never been like uh, an event like we're putting on now, but things that have like the, a flow of an evening, like you're saying, like the review where we have a little bit of music, sometimes uh, some poetry. You're going to talk about the Enneagram. We're going to interview Bob Goff. It's going to be lots of laughs, lots of fun. Yep. I mean, it's a really, really cool experience. It is. And how do you get tickets, Anthony? You go to typologypodcast.com. That's T-Y-P-O-L-O-G-Y podcast.com and get your tickets on. It's going to be a great night. It's going to be a fun time. I, I cannot, can't wait. I cannot wait. And I cannot wait for today's interview. Yes, it's going to be a good one. We have a return guest. And she was a fabulous uh, guest the first time and a big hit with our listeners. Yeah, and I suspect she will be today. Yes, agreed. Ann Bogle. Ann Bogle. Yes, she is the author of Reading People and uh, her other book, I'd Rather Be Reading. She's the creator of the blog Modern Mrs. Darcy and host of the podcasts What Should I Read Next and One Great Book. All right, she... I mean, I love Ann Bogle, num number one, because the two of us share a real love for, for reading. She has a brand new book out right now. Mm -hmm. It's called Don't Overthink It. Make Easier Decisions, Stop Second Guessing, and Bring More Joy to Your Life. And you know, this book drops on March 3rd, and I'm excited for it because, and this interview, because she's an Enneagram 9. Yes. And when I saw that she had written a book called Don't, <laughs> Don't Overthink, Overthink It, it <laughs> Make Easier Decisions, etc., I was like, holy smokes, a nine is going to teach us about not overthinking right. and making better decisions, which, yeah. quite frankly, is typically not the gift set one associates with nines. Right, right. Right? That's right. So, I mean, I can't wait to jump into a conversation with a nine about something she's clearly had to do a lot of work around. Right. And, you know, she's written books about personality, so this is a, a second language for her. Yeah. You know, like she really, this oh, is going to be awesome. Yeah. She's so articulate, man. It's going to be a good one. Can't wait. That's right. So, everybody, put on your seatbelts. We're going to have a great ride today with my guest, Anne Bogle. Anne Bogle. 
Ann Bogle, welcome to Typology. Oh, it's a pleasure to be back. Thank you, Ian. I am so excited about your new book. Oh, thank you for that. Uh, Don't Overthink It is the name of the book. And um, I'm really excited about talking to you about it because you're an Enneagram 9. I am indeed. The Peacemaker. And you are one of those types that tends to overthink things. And you're one of those types who, uh, like sixes, struggles with decision making, which I also know is a big feature of your new book. For Just for the sake of everyone listening, brief arc of what the book is about, and then I am going to jump in because like, I looked at the title of the book and I'm like, an Enneagram 9 is writing a book about don't overthink things and decision making. <laughs> and I'm like, either this girl is totally in denial or she has done a lot of really good work on herself, which I think is probably the case. And I, I just can't wait to jump into it. Let everyone know what the book's about. Well, I was guilty of some massive overthinking just yesterday. So there's that. Um, so Ian, we all know what overthinking is, right? Repetitive, oh, yeah. unhealthy, unhelpful thoughts. Your brain is working really hard, but it's getting absolutely nowhere. Um, it's exhausting and it makes you feel like garbage. So as a type nine, you're so right. Like I have had my fair share of overthinking. What really interests me in writing this book is not only being able to share what I have learned about overcoming overthinking, because I'm like, I'm not a psychotherapist. I'm not an expert, but I have a person. I'm a person who've learned some things that I put into action in my life and they've made a huge difference. And if I can help others by sharing those things, then I'd love to see them turn things around. And the reason is the thing that really captured me about this topic is I found that so many of us think that overthinking is this annoying thing we do sometimes. It's obnoxious, but it's kind of value neutral. But I've really come to see that overthinking comes at a huge opportunity cost. What we're doing with our hours and our minutes is what we're doing with our lives. Mm. And we don't want to spend our lives overthinking. So I'd love to see people put this practice aside so they can really spend more time on the things that matter and bring more peace, love, and joy into their lives. Because when you're overthinking, that is what you're losing. Awesome. What a great praises of that book, man. (laughs) And I'm I can't wait to read it. It in I uh, because I do think you're you're absolutely right that we live in a culture. I mean, if for no other reason, we're 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 I think we suffer from optionality fatigue. You know, we're just there's you know, I can't go to the freaking store to buy sneakers without being overwhelmed by six thousand possible you know uh, new iterations <laughs> of running shoes that I and and so I think if nothing else that in itself is a a, a cultural problem. Mm. And of course, there's just neuroscience that says pretty much that 80% of our thoughts are not new. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like we tend Mm -hmm. to overthink about the same things Mm. all the time as well. Is that your experience? Uh, Personally, yes. And also that's definitely what I found in the research. Mm. So tell me what it was yesterday that you were overthinking. Oh, it was a blog post about my new book. Okay. <laughs> You're overthinking How's about that overthinking. For yeah. Yeah. I mean, I wanted to tell a little story and what I thought was, well, this might be more interesting with some background. Ooh, but there's background to that story. And I just kept taking it back. And at a certain point you have to decide, what are you actually talking about? Like, what is the scope of this? And, you know, 50 minutes later, I ended up, do you want to guess where I ended up? Where? Right back at the place I started. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I've done that a thousand times while writing a book. <laughs> that would be absolutely. Oh, that's funny because it's so relatable. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So you do self-describe as a chronic overthinker. You just gave us an example of it. Can you give us um, through the lens of the Enneagram or let me ask you this. Mm-hmm. How has the Enneagram helped you understand yourself and your tendency to overthink? Oh, that's really interesting. Well, I'm a type nine. So I am very aware that I like to step back and look at all the options. Mm -hmm. I see whole landscapes of possibilities that other people simply don't see. And Ian, I think that's a real gift. Like, I love that part of being a nine. But it was really eye opening and also extremely helpful for me to see that that same 
ability also could get me into all kinds of trouble. Because when you see landscapes that other people just don't see, that means you see choices that other people just don't have to deal with. And it really helped me understand why is this hard? Mm. Also, I'm a nine and I'm right there next to that one. And perfectionism and overthinking so often go hand in hand. Okay, I want you to unpack that more because Mm -hmm. uh, perfectionism Mm -hmm. is a huge problem for people. Whether you're, I mean, any number can be a a perfectionist. Ones Mm -hmm. happen to be, you know, masterful at it. Uh, Fours, I think, are the second most perfectionist number on the Enneagram. What, talk to me about perfectionism for a minute and how it it screws up thinking for you, for you as a nine. Oh, well, I call myself a recovering perfectionist, but I still, it's something that I still notice myself doing um, reflexively all the time. When you're committed to getting the best option or the right, picture those air quotes, the right option in any circumstance, that means that you need to do the work to make sure that your option is the best one. And you Mm. need to compare it to other options and you need to keep looking to make sure no other better options sneak up. And You make so many decisions every day. If you Mm -hmm. want them all to be correct and you're putting this pressure on yourself to get it right the first time every time, uh, that consumes an enormous amount of mental energy, an impossible Mm. amount of mental energy. Nobody has that much. So you exhaust yourself on the things that really don't matter and then you don't have any mental resources left to deal with the things that really do. Right. Oh, that is so good. So, you know, nines, um, we uh, talk a lot about the inner sanctum of nines. Do you know about that? From you, I do. Oh, from me, you do. <laughs> well, when, for those of you who don't, when overwhelmed or when conflict threatens, uh, sometimes nines can tune out, right, mm-hmm. and, and withdraw into this place in their minds we call the inner sanctum, right? And... Uh, in that space, they uncouple from, kind of uncouple from life's energy and ignore the call to action on something. And that's, you know, kind of, my wife describes it as a nine. Like she goes up and you can see sometimes they kind of get this spacey, far off, you know, looking, <laughs> looking, getting the thousand mile distance look, you know. And on the outside, it looks very calm. But on the inside, things are going crazy in terms of decision making. And the, what do I do? What do I do? So is, how is that for you as a nine? And how, what disciplines have you learned to get yourself out of that space? That's so interesting. Uh, what I found most helpful is to anticipate that and plan for it. Mm. I Well, it's winter right now. So this isn't necessarily my coping mechanism of choice in the summertime, but it's cold outside. And so we have the jigsaw puzzles out. I love puzzles so much, Ian. I'm going to be such a great 80-year-old. I'm like in training, ready to go. But that's just an example of a way that I can give myself some space, give my brain something to focus on that definitely requires thought and mental energy, but it's a different kind than I'm spending throughout my day. And um, it, it gives me the opportunity to regroup, to solve a solvable problem in a way that doesn't involve um, any, any potential for uh, whining or lashing out at other people. Hey, Typology Tribe, I want to take a moment to thank one of our sponsors for helping us bring you what I hope is great content every week. Now, you all know, obviously, I'm a psychotherapist, and so I'm a big proponent of counseling. So whether you feel like something is interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving certain goals, counseling is a great tool to help identify what those blocks are and then work through them. Yet, and I think probably many of you know this, finding a therapist can sometimes feel intimidating. Here comes the good news. BetterHelp offers online counseling at your own time and your own pace. You can schedule secure video or phone sessions plus text and chat with your therapist when it's convenient for you. That's huge, right? These are licensed professional counselors who specialize in things like depression, anxiety, stress, relationships, LGBT matters, trauma, and grief. BetterHelp has counselors available worldwide and have over 3,000 
1,000 U.S. licensed therapists across all 50 states. And get this, if you're not satisfied with your counselor for any reason, you can request a new one at any time at no additional cost. Best of all, it's a truly affordable option. And as a special offer for Typology listeners, BetterHelp is offering 10% off your first month with the discount code Typology Podcast. So why not get started today? Go to betterhelp.com slash T-Y-P-O-L-O-G-Y-P-O-D-C-A-S-T. Simply fill out a questionnaire to help them assess your needs and get matched with a counselor you will love. Again, that's betterhelp.com slash typology podcast, T-Y-P-O-L-O-G-Y-P-O-D-C-A-S-T, betterhelp.com slash typology podcast. Check them out. All right, what are some not so obvious ways that that we overthink. Ooh, okay. Well, to me, the perfectionism driven overthinking was huge. I just didn't see the connection, but once I, once I did, it made so much sense. I find that the things that we don't think of is being overthinking until it's until we really take the time to articulate it as such is when we talk ourselves out of good things. I don't know what your experience is being a man. I know for many women, we have this inner critic in our brain that says, don't burn the good candle. Don't buy the flowers. Buy the generic, even though you know you like the name brand chocolate a lot more. But if you pay attention, if you relate to this, listeners, and you listen to what's going on in your brain at the grocery store, um, just think about how you monitor the decisions you are making and see if you aren't maybe conversing with yourself more than is necessary about what choices you want to make. And if you aren't talking yourself out of potentially good things that you know you really enjoy, that don't cost a lot of money, that don't take extra effort just because you think that you don't need it or there's not a reason right now. We think our way out of happiness so many times, rarely do we think our way into it unless we do it on purpose. And there's, there's no need for this. I think we do it out of habit and out of long time training from our childhood. You know, this is so great. My wife is a quintessential one to one nine. Okay. And, uh, she is doing so much work. In fact, later today, we're doing for the very first time, uh, a podcast interview with just my wife and I talking about, <gasps> Our, our growth as a result of the Enneagram and yeah. some other things in our lives. And, it, and it's been revolutionary. So here's another reason I think nines overthink things. Okay. Mm-hmm. My wife went to a, I don't know, some kind of craft thing in, in Georgia, uh, some town where they do a lot of these, uh, like a big craft town or something. And she saw a Johnny was jacket. Okay, this beautiful embroidered, like, you know, coat made by Johnny was mm-hmm. and it was expensive, right? I mean, it was like five or six hundred dollars. All right. And she texts me a picture of it and she's like, I don't know if I should get it. I, I mean, it's really expensive, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and, you know, may, oh, oh, and maybe I, I relate could, to that soundtrack. <laughs> oh, okay. And maybe I could find it for 20% off somewhere yeah. in Nashville, blah, blah, blah. And I, I just text it back to her and I said, well, number one, you don't need to ask me whether or not you can buy that coat. You know, like, like you know, you can. Uh, and here's the other reason why this was happening mm-hmm. as a nine. It was because um, she didn't think she deserved it. Like she wasn't special enough to deserve it. And I think that's a little bit of what you're describing. Sometimes in the grocery store, you're like, ah, I should probably buy the generic brand, the chocolate brand. You know what I'm saying? It's mm-hmm. like to stop and say, you know, and I'm not talking about buying a Maserati here, you know, it, 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 but what I'm talking about is sometimes nines will see things mm. that they want and then they go because they have this tendency to think their presence doesn't matter, that they're not as important as other mm-hmm. people. They think it's kind of selfish to indulge themselves that way. So she and so what does she do? Right. I told her to get it and she didn't get it. Right. So, and, and she said, I just, I couldn't make up my mind. I was just sort mm-hmm. of on the fence. So 
we, we came home and down here at a, at a mall in Nashville, there's a Johnny Was store. And I said, is that code in that dang store? And she said, yeah. And I said, I am getting in the car right now. And I am driving to Johnny Was and I'm going to buy you that dang coat because you deserve it and you've overthought it. I just think you ought to have mm-hmm. it. Now, mm-hmm. was it a little, you know, I mean, 600 bucks for a coat. Is that a little crazy? Sure. But I can just tell you from experience, my wife never indulges her in mm-hmm. herself. She self forgets mm-hmm. like most nines. I have mm-hmm. to actually say to her, you know, hey, go do this for yourself. So I totally relate to what you're saying. Mm-hmm. And what it requires, I think for all types, and you described it, is the development of a neutral inner witness who in the moment can observe their way they're thinking mm. and then step back from it compassionately and say, mm-hmm. you know, you're overthinking this and, you know, wake up and choose in this moment not to overthink it. But that takes the ability to step back from your thought patterns, mm-hmm. observe them and mm-hmm. make it and make a new choice. And that metacognition is not easy. Something else I want to point out is that your wife was struggling with whether or not to buy a $600 jacket, but we also torment ourselves about buying a Pilot G2. This is a pen that costs $1.19 at Walgreens because we have a free one from the bank that'll work just fine. Um, I find that with these big splurges, though, is that we get stuck when we don't know how to think about a problem. Like my mom taught me how to shop when I was little for clothes. And if I was looking at this nice coat, she would ask me, okay, what is your cost per wear going to be? How many times are you going to wear that? So now if I look at buying something expensive, I know that I've been taught to think about this kind of problem in this specific way. But there are situations we face in our life where the logic just breaks down. Like you can't think about buying a prom dress or a wedding dress in terms of cost per wear. It just doesn't work. And so if the way we've been taught to think about a problem fails us, I find that we flounder as we try to grasp for another way to even think about the problem. That is so really good, good for nines. Yeah. I mean, that is such good news wow. for nines. And I hope nines, male and female, because mm-hmm. I think men and women both mm-hmm. both struggle with this, mm-hmm. um, to begin to have almost a decision-making matrix. Mm. You, you know, that's kind of what yeah. you're just Yeah, describing. that's exactly what I'm talking about. Right. I mean, and, I don't have a flow chart on my wall or anything, but over time, if you pay, if you pay attention, if you do step back and assess the way you're thinking about a problem, you can consciously take note of how you apply different decision-making frameworks to different decisions. Okay. That's like, so great. Keep going. I mean, anyone who's ever bought Hamilton tickets is not doing it because of the enjoyment they'll get per minute. They're buying it for the experience, for the memories, for the once in a lifetime feel of it. And if you've been 10 times, we don't really want to hear about that, but we're jealous. But you you have you're choosing based on something when you choose to like do that big splurge, when you buy tickets for the big thing, when you fly across the country to see a person, you're doing it because you know that it matters to you and you know why. Um, but it can be like surprisingly difficult to, to grasp at first why one decision requires one set of or one decision making approach and another seemingly similar decision requires a totally different approach. Here, I have a silly story for you. Okay. Okay. I went to Scotland last year and It was, we had a great week. It was magical. Um, But I had one lingering regret and it's going to sound super silly. Uh, We love the Great British Baking Show in my house. Oh my gosh, we are absolutely, (laughs) ask ask Anthony, Uh, addicted. We watched, like when we finished watching all the seasons, we mourned for like two days. (laughs) It just brings me so much peace and joy. And also as a nine, it's about the only reality TV I can watch. And it's still, (laughs) I still cry every time somebody goes home. No joke every time. But when we went to Scotland, I saw baked goods in the display cases that I had only ever seen at the Great British Baking Show. I can't get them in the US. I Mm. definitely can't get them in Kentucky. So I came home from the trip and I told my kids about like, oh, all these amazing baked goods we saw. We even saw a Bakewell tart. And they said, oh my gosh, mom, what did it taste like? And I said, I have no idea. I don't eat a lot of sugar. Like I just didn't try it. And they were like, that was a bad decision. 
<laughs> and <laughs> yes, it was. And I realized I knew that I had left Scotland not trying this Bakewell tart and it really bothered me. And I thought, that's silly. Why is it bothering me so much that I didn't try this dessert when I don't even eat dessert that much? And I realized, um, as I kept thinking about this, because it was pestering me, that I had made a decision in Scotland, someplace I'd never been, might not ever go again, but I, but I hope so, this special, unique adventure. Um, I decided whether or not I wanted dessert based on, um, is it like really healthy for me to have sugar right then? Like, Ian... I was in Scotland. I should have made the decision based on, hey, I'm here to try new things. So let's try new things. It costs like three bucks. Right. If I had had a bite of Bakewell tart, which might have been terrible, but that would have been a story too. And I would still have had the experience. Um, three bucks for one bite. The rest could have just like gone in the trash or to mm. a friend. And it would have been the right call. But I was making what looked like the right decision for my normal life. I mean, I thought I was making a decision about what to eat, but that wasn't at all what the decision was about. The decision was about, do I want to have this new experience? And it's still a piece of cake either way, but it's a totally different way of thinking about it. And I've really learned that if we can look at the decisions we're facing in our life, um, so many of them, it's the question is not what you think it's about. There's a question behind the question. And you can really get in the habit of zoning in on that question behind the question faster once you know what to look for, once you get the hang of it, and it makes decisions so much easier. Mm. And it really prevents you from texting and <laughs> texting your friend or husband going, ah, I don't know what I should do. Help me figure this out. What should I do? Should I buy it? Should I not? If you can see what's really at stake, not at stake exactly, but what really the issue is, then it brings so much clarity and then you can move forward. Okay, so just jumping back for one second about the coat. <laughs> I just want to say that we have gotten our money per wear out of that coat. <laughs> Since my wife has bought that coat, I think she has worn it to bed several times <laughs> because she loves it that much. I, I just uh, just want to make it clear that we have gotten a tremendous amount of value out, out of that coat. But now, Well, even if she hadn't worn it 600 times... Um, uh, someone told me that if you if you have also been raised with a cost per wear mentality and can't imagine like spending the big bucks for something you'll only wear a few times a year, that the love per wear you get out of an mm, item that's good. is a it's a different way to think about it. Oh man, I love this. Hey everybody, one of the lessons I've learned over the years is that not everybody benefits from a traditional 50 minute counseling session. And this is why some people can go to couples therapy or personal counseling for a long time and never really get anywhere. This is why I'm such a believer of intensive counseling and my friends at Restoring the Soul in Colorado, created by my longtime friend, Michael Cusick, to help couples or individuals experience deep change and have day blocks over one or two weeks. Now listen, if you can't wait months or years to get to the bottom of an issue or to experience breakthrough, you need to get in touch with my friend Michael and his extraordinary team of counselors at Restoring the Soul. If you're looking to get out of the rut you're in but can't wait months or years, call Restoring the Soul today for a free consultation with Michael's staff. Call 303-932-9777 and learn how their intensive counseling process can help you. As a special bonus, just for typology, listeners make sure to visit www.restoringthesoul.com slash typology to download their pdf called five ways unaddressed trauma may be derailing your relationships i i, I want to just maybe let people know something about nines that i find so fascinating and that is we got nines perched at the top of the enneagram right so if you think about the two sides right? Mm -hmm. They have one foot in three and the other foot in six. Do you see that? So they're up oh, at the... Oh, yeah. Mm. <laughs> so three and I six. Feel it. Okay. So what people may not know is that threes mm -hmm. are the most compliant number on the Enneagram. Okay. Mm. And sixes are the most nonconformist, anti-authoritarian number on the other gram. So what happens for them sometimes mm -hmm. is they get torn between wanting to please mm -hmm. at three and defy at six, right? 
when they're faced with a decision, then sometimes they'll smile and look uh, calm on the outside, but on the inside, right, they're actually all stirred up because there's a the nonconformist side wants to say no and the conformist side wants to say yes. How does that ring with your experience? Um, yes. <laughs> can you can you hear me nodding? That's so interesting that you say that because when I think about when I move towards three, when I think about the threes, I know conformity is not something I think of. But to hear you put it that way is really interesting. Um, well, but espe- especially as a female, the like smiling and nodding on the outside and being really mad about it on the inside is something that um, resonates I, I wonder <laughs> to that, an uncomfortable degree. Do you think that's a gender thing or do you think it's a nine thing? That's interesting. I don't. I wonder if it's not both and. I'm sure there's a well, I mean, the Enneagram is so much about socialization but i think that as a woman i've been socialized to smile and nod right especially in my family of origin okay so you're absolutely right i think Mm -hmm. you know there are cultural uh pressures that uh help form our personalities obviously um but i do think there's part of us in our type that's just there are patterns that are just warp and woof of who we are right mm-hmm. in, our, in our types and if we can can begin to develop that inner witness and i love what you said and i think it's actually a, like a, a a mantra for me which is pay attention to what you pay attention to yes right paying attention is like an enneagram discipline pay attention to what you're thinking pay attention to what you're feeling pay attention to what you're doing are you on autopilot right now or in your personality patterns or are you awake and making free choices based on mm-hmm. uh, a different you know set of, of values and desires right um, so I I guess for me um, in those moments I think for nines when they're sort of stuck between being a conformist and being a defier right if they can just step back and pay attention they won't get lost in that nether zone between the two and then smile on the outside because what happens is they'll smile and say yes on the outside Mm -hmm. but on the inside what they'll do is slow things down if they didn't want to do it Mm -hmm. Uh, so that everything gets behind schedule and everything gets kind of discombobulated. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting because something that I found so tremendously helpful in overcoming overthinking is just like I was talking about with the Bakewell tart is figure out what you care about, make it a habit of living out your values. And then what you do flows naturally out of who you are. And what you're describing is the nine with one foot and three and one foot and six wanting to do two things simultaneously that are impossible to do at the same time. Um, you, there's no, there's no flow cause you can't be both. Mm, absolutely. All right. Now so me- you're just stuck. Yep. Yeah. You're just stuck. And then what happens for nines is they get, they become fence sitters and then they, (laughs) they they don't, and what they do is they're, they're, they're a uh, sitting on the fence because if making a decision might lead to conflict, right? Mm -hmm. So they're trying to avoid conflict and maintain inner peace, or they're waiting for life to come along and make the decision for them. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, Which as you know, rarely ends well. (laughs) Funny because it's true. Because decision making takes mm-hmm. courage. It really does. Right? It really takes courage. Mm. Um, all right. So we've talked about decisions, uh, you know, my wife's coat experience, your experience uh, with the cake, which is not silly because cakes are very important to me. Um, what about what about big decisions in life? Like what about when you're faced with um, should we have another child? Uh, my child is sick and there's mm-hmm. two courses of action that mm-hmm. we can take here. Uh, the doctors recommend, which one should we take? Mm-hmm. You, know, you know what I mean? Like the really big decisions mm-hmm. in life, are they different than the day-to-day decisions and how you treat them? That's so interesting because everything in me wants to say, yes, of course they are. Um, 
big decisions require big thoughts. And yet at the same time, Ian, so many of us, including myself for sure, have made hugely important decisions um, really quickly going from my gut, just knowing in my core that it was the right thing. So that's difficult to answer. Um, I do want to say that in the book, when I'm talking about overthinking, it's not saying don't think, um, but it's not overthinking if you're giving something the amount of thought you want to. It, that could be like, let's say um, it brings you joy and entertainment to research 40 different destinations for your summer vacation. It's not overthinking if you give it the amount of attention you want to. And at the same time, if you're dividing, if you're deciding if you want to have another child, that's a big decision. Oh, and talk about a decision requiring courage. It's not overthinking if you're giving something the amount of attention it deserves. Mm. And yet at the same time, especially as a nine, I'm very aware that it's possible to think and think and think and think, and it's not productive. And I can think so long that the opportunity itself can pass me by. Mm. So I think what you're describing, uh, that is sort of a wonderful revelation for me, is what in Enneagram uh, vernacular we call right action. Mm -hmm. So there comes a moment when the nine is faced with a decision or a circumstance that they just have this gut feeling I have to do this no matter what. I have to take this action. No matter how much conflict it might cause, mm -hmm. no matter how much of a headache it's going to cause, mm -hmm. no matter if it's going to actually destroy a relationship that I have, I must take this action. And then they just go for it. They just don't overthink it. They just go for it, you know, and make a decision. So I think that's may maybe that's what you're describing are those right action moments. It might be. I will say when you're asking this question, I was put in mind of a book that I read maybe five, six years ago by the Heath brothers. It's kind of a businessy book. It's called Decisive, How to Make Better Choices in Life and Work. But I've come back to look at it over the years because one of the very um, practical and also um, scary decisions that they they show someone making in the book is the choice of whether or not to have extreme surgery. I think it was a perhaps a heart transplant. I'm not positive about the heart transplant, but I know it was a major medical decision that was optional, but it wouldn't be optional for long. And they really explored how this person approached this massive decision. And I found it so interesting that something like that just seems terrifying. Hmm. Should you have this surgery, with, which is not without risks, but could really transform your life for the better, could, could make it so you live to see your kids grow up, or do you stick with what you've got? which is a sure thing, but only for maybe another decade. Mm. Like, how do you face a question like that? So when I say, how do you face a question like that? I would think it's rhetorical, but they walked through how exactly this person faced a question like that. And it was fascinating to me. Mm, sounds like As a someone who's more a gut person, you know, they were approaching it from a very rational, linear perspective, which does not come naturally to me, Ian. And I really appreciated seeing Broken Down. Wow. I hope I never have to make a decision like that, but... But we people do, and it was good to see that there are there are at least paths forward that aren't just I don't know throw darts at the wall or hope for the best. You know, I think um, in terms of strategies uh, for what to do with overthinking and decision making and how it relates to the enneagram, when nines are not in a great space, right? Mm -hmm. They go to or I should say, don't be surprised if you go to the low side of six, right? Mm -hmm. And when you're there, you have more anxiety than you mm -hmm. normally do, uh, more self-doubt, decision-making becomes harder, you become a little bit more paranoid and worst case scenario thinking, you know, like if I buy this jacket, we won't eat for the next month. Uh, <laughs> or, uh, mm -hmm. and you, you, you may be more inclined to play follow the leader because the leader, you will you will sort of acquiesce to what the leader wants, right? Because that'll maintain the peace and, and get you off the hook a little bit, right? And what you want to do, maybe if a nine is faced with overthinking and having trouble making decisions, is the, to pay attention mm -hmm. and decide to go toward the high side of three, which is their security point, mm -hmm. where, you know, they can start to make 
a more linear decision or path like the one you were describing in that book by the Heath brothers. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I hope that, you know, nines who, who find themselves in that position think, how do I get to three right now? How, how do I get to a place where I'm um, putting together a decision tree almost mm -hmm. Have you got a decision tree? Like, you know, like, like, a, like, like, okay, when I'm faced with a decision. I'm a nine, so you know it's not an actual tree. I mean, I don't know that I could flow chart it for you. And yet, like, I do, I, I kind of do. Yeah. You're, what you're describing right now really reminds me of something I used to habitually do in any decision involving spending a lot of money. I'm, I'm a saver by nature. Uh, my brother's a huge spender by nature. I don't know if this is biology or we just, if the birth order had been reversed, we would have turned out differently. I don't know. But spending a lot of money makes me feel uncomfortable. Maybe I feel like I don't deserve it. I don't know. But I know that it doesn't feel good. So I used to habitually do this thing where I'd spend a lot of money and I'd promptly go exactly that low six place they're thinking about, oh my gosh, what have we done? Can we get it back? Can I take it back? Can I return it? Can I get the money? Will it be okay? How much is in the bank? Can I undo it? What was I thinking? Like every time um, I would go that place and I really, I wasn't consciously striving for the high side of three, but what I've learned to tell myself is like, you're doing this for a purpose. You chose this for a purpose. Like you are, um, Let's say I bought tickets to something expensive, but that I really wanted to go to. This is going to be enjoyable. This makes sense for you. This is in line with your values. Um, that's something that I came to coincidentally and with the help of a uh, <laughs> other people in my life who are not type nines. But your description of going from low six to high nine really makes sense to mm. me. Well, Ann Bogle's new book, Don't Overthink It, Make Easier Decisions, Stop Second Guessing, and Bring More Joy to Your Life on Baker Books, coming out March 3rd, 2020. I'm so excited to get my hands on it. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And I think it's going to be a great book for Enneagram Nines. I think they're really going to see themselves because you're a nine. And uh, as a result of your doing the work and... You know, I think it's going to be a great little torch on the path for them to think through how do I become a person who's a more confident decision maker, mm -hmm. uh, somebody who doesn't get lost in the inner sanctum where I overthink things, you know, and uh, how do I just become somebody who is spending a whole lot less time on you know, sitting on the fence and wondering what to do and debating back and forth and, and get to the things in life that will really bring me joy. I hope so. Cause there's a lot at stake. I mean, what, what you think about from moment to moment, what you choose to pay attention to, that is what adds up to a life. Yes. Couldn't ask for a better ending. And thank you so much for being on typology. Thank you, Ian. And of course, Typology listeners, don't forget the words of the great Oscar Wilde. Be yourself. Everybody else is already taken.